Business Tuesday continues with your money, your call. Hello, welcome to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. If you have a question about shares, our phone lines are open right now on 1300 30 34 35, or you can always email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au. And joining me on the panel, we're very lucky to have Joe Mager from Motley Fool and also Russell Muldoon from Montgomery Investment Management. So the market's been doing fairly well in October. Is it going to continue in November and December? Let's ask our panelists how they're positioning portfolios at the moment, what they're looking at. Um, we'll start off with you, Russell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when the market sold off down to that sort of 5,000 level, um, we actually put a lot more into the market. So we've been at running uh, cash levels about 30% over the last probably six months. Uh, six, well, longer than that, probably six to 12 months. Um, and when we dip down to that 5,000 level, the PE contracted to about 14 times forward earnings. Um, and a lot of our companies, although they are higher quality, they didn't fall as much. We actually found a couple of new opportunities to deploy some cash. Oh, and uh, and we, we added to our existing holdings those that, that fell a little bit, but not as much as the market. So we went from about being 70% invested to about 80, 82% invested. Um, that's proven to be quite, quite, quite a good move for our clients. Um, we've outperformed the market both on the downside because we had higher cash levels when the market was falling, and we've p performed about it equally as well as the market when it's rallied. Now we haven't had any exposure to resources, and of course resources have uh, been some. We were talking about some gold companies today, seven and a half percent, and now they're a dollar forty-four. I mean, it's been a remarkable turnaround. But look, we're not invested in that part of the market at all. We're much more longer term investors um, but we are, we're generally happy with the portfolio and where we're invested at the moment. Okay so good to hear that you've been adding to portfolios so um, going from about those 30 percent cash levels now to 82 percent invested in the market. How about you Joe? Looking yeah. at the market are you seeing opportunities here? Are you excited or, or is it difficult to find? Well, it's investing? difficult. So we're sitting on about 8 percent cash today. Uh, when the market pulled back we added to some positions. There were some that we looked at and thought about putting more money to work into new ones but they weren't just quite there. Uh, for the most part, I still think stocks are pretty expensive right now here in Australia and, and globally, but particularly here. Uh, despite the pullback, I still think the banks are expensive and we've managed to dodge that bullet and resources, uh, which I think will continue to struggle. But yeah, overall, it's been tough to find value and you know, particularly if you're trying to protect your downside by looking at companies with strong balance sheets, uh, recurring revenue models, they're out there. It's just that there aren't yeah, you're, you're, you're going to struggle to find 20 to 30 of those put in your portfolio. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that stands out for me in the past week is the central banks around the globe looking like, you know, we're going to see this lower for longer story playing out for a lot longer. Even longer. <laughs> Even longer. Um, so, you know, what does this mean for your investing investment strategy? Um, does it change things at all? Certainly, you know, it seems to be supportive of the market. Yeah, well, I try not to overthink the macro, but the reality is that if the Fed ag aggressively stepped back from a rate increase, I think that would have some pretty big moves on currencies globally. I mean, it would soften the USD, but probably also give room for uh, Uncle Glenn to cut mm -hmm. rates here. I think you'd almost certainly see that, and there'd be, you know, another wave of rate cuts and liquidity everywhere, all over. Absolutely. And um, I mean, you know, we don't talk a lot about the macro factors on the show, mm. but mm. it has been a key driver of markets and investment returns throughout sure. the last five sure. years. So um, what, what's your view, Russell? Oh, look, we don't play that game. We, we don't play the yield game. Uh, we don't chase companies specifically just for their dividend yield. Um, we're, our big focus is on companies that have the ability to deploy a lot of capital and have uh, the ability to deploy that capital very, very profitably. That's what creates value in, in the longer term. You know, you look at Telstra. Um, Telstra's profits today are the same as they were 10 years ago. Uh, the share price went down to $3. It got chased up by yield investors to, to $6 or $7. Um, yeah, it's 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 not a growth business. Instead, there's been MTU, TPG, Vocus. You know, we've owned all these shares. Um, these have been consolidated with the market and taking market share away from Optus, Vodafone, um, and Telstra. You know, we, we've participated handsomely in in businesses which who are able to deploy a lot of capital and a lot of capital profitably. So, you know, we continuously hunt for those sort of companies. We're not interested just because the yields, uh, um, sorry, interest rates are falling globally and they're going to probably fall in November. 
you know, we're looking at another rate cut coming. Um, we're not playing that game. We're not lowering our discount rates. For, we're equity investors and we want an equity return. Um, but our, our focus is 100% on companies that can deploy a lot of capital. And there's still a lot out there. Do you mean? There's still companies that are reinvesting for growth. A lot less than what there was five years ago, but they're, they're still out there. And the benefit of, of us at Montgomery is well, we run highly concentrated portfolios. So like Joe, Joe said, you wouldn't be able to fill a portfolio today with 30 businesses, but we're not looking at 30 or 40 companies. We're looking at you know, maybe 20 at most, maybe 25. So. Okay, I'll be interested to get your stock picks because it sounds like both of you have been on the buying trail over the last couple of months. But before we do that, let's go to our first caller of the night. We have John from Maitland on the line. John, welcome to the show. How can we help you out today? Hi, Julia. Thanks for taking my... Um, my query is about Collection House, CLH. Uh, there's been a bit of a pullback in the last few days and I was just wanting to get the panel's views on the stock. Sure. So having a look at Collection House, it's a business that buys uh, debt obligations and I guess collects on that. Um, I think recently, uh, I think at its annual general meeting actually, uh, the company said um, that it's expecting to see a record year. Um, uh, so uh, just having a look at a company like this, uh, Joe, would it be one that you, you'd be buying? Uh, I'm, I'm not buying today, but virtually everyone I work with uh, does own the shares and they're all pretty big fans. Uh, they, they look at it and they see, you know, a low teens multiple, uh, just a bit above 10. I think we're talking about 11 times earnings. You get a yield above 4% and they have uh, confidence that essentially, you know, these guys go out, they buy debt and then they collect on that debt, right? So when the economy is doing well, they get good returns on what they bought, but when it goes sour, that means that they overpaid. So it can be pretty cyclical, and because of that, I'm not into the shares myself today, but if you do have confidence that the economy is gonna hold up, then the shares are probably pretty cheap today. Okay, so I mean, Collection House recently, though, its, it's shares have really dropped off mm. um, quite severely, and uh, it, we know that you know anyone exposed to that short-term lending area has been pretty much smashed on the market and Collection House also recently that said that they'd be withdrawing from that area. Mm. Um, Russell, what are your thoughts around Collection House? Um, so, look, I think you've, you've had a big change. You've had Pioneer Credit List, you've had, you know, seeking more capital to buy debt ledgers, you've had Collection House being pretty aggressive, raising money, uh, buying debt ledgers, you've had Credit Corp, who's the major player in the market, you know, they have about, uh, I think about 40 or 50 percent market share, you know, they've been pretty aggressive in the market and when, when you've got so many players and and you got obviously unlisted players such as Bay Corp. Um, I think it is actually now listed. It's uh, being bought by a, 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 almost a private equity vehicle. Um, when you've got so many players, players able to get access to capital cheaply, um, what happens to your returns? And your returns come down, you know, on these ledgers. And they're not they're not riskless things. You know, these are these are bad debt ledger books, which are, you know it could be 90 days, 60, day, 100 days, 180 days, um, you know, past due. So you know you've got to go in there and you've got to use your workforce and, and deliver and try to collect, you know, and get a return on your investment. You know, it's not an easy business to run. But the big thing is, um, you know, Credit Corp have been trying to crack into the U.S. market and they've been unsuccessful because the returns over there are paltry compared to. Australia, you know, Australia was still getting sort of 16 to 18 percent ROEs on on investment. That's that's pretty attractive. But what's happened is, I believe the business is called Encore, and Encore is a U.S. company, and it's 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 got a big balance sheet, and it's also coming into Australia. So I think that has the market kind of spooked. Um, you got another, you got a, a, effectively a player that's bigger than the the, the dominant player, Credit Corp, at the moment coming in. Um, they'll take probably 12 months to set up, but of course the market looks ahead of time. So they're looking what could happen in 12 months. You know, big player, credible player coming to the market. What's going to happen to the returns on these ledgers? They're going to come down even further. Okay, so, so. increased competition in this area. Um, but given where the shares have fallen, would mm. you be picking up stock at these prices? No, no, we're not interested um, at these prices. We think, you know, if, if a serious player did come in and brought returns which are good at the moment, you know, everyone seems to be happy and the returns are coming down, but they're coming down gradually, but if he comes in and fights really hard for market share, you know, you could really see those returns fall off the perch, so you know, we're, we're, we're watching from afar at the moment. Okay. You know, we've owned Credit Corp in the past, we know it very, very well, um, but we're not there at the moment. Okay, so John, hope that helps you out there. So we're looking at Collection House, CLH, but we're also talking about Credit Corp. Let's go to our next call, we've got Des on the line from Victoria. Des, welcome to the show. What's your question? Hey, you, you Hi. Uh, How can we help yeah. you? Uh, I'd be very interested to hear the panel's views on a company, an up-and-coming IT company, Mobile Embrace. 
Sure. So let's have a look at Mobile and Brace. MBE is the stock co there. Um, the stock hasn't been travelling too badly this year. If we have a look at this company, it's quite unique in the market at the moment. It has a, a mobile payments area as well as a mobile marketing um, division as well. And it's almost an integrated play. So really a, a, a strong technology business that's quite unique in terms of this space. Um, and also expanding into Asia. It's just recently announced that it'd be expanding into to the Malaysian market. So um, we might go to Russell first on this one. What do you think of Mobile Embrace? Uh, Des, unfortunately, um, this is not a business that I know. It's a little bit too small for us. It's only a, got a market capitalization of uh, 99 million. Um, looks like it's a, an M payments, mobile payments business. Um, unfortunately, you know, if I was to think about that space at the moment, there are a lot of people uh, competing for market share. There's a lot of technology coming down the pipe. There's a lot of ways to pay on your mobile phone. You've got Apple Pay. You've, you know, Android is no doubt going to come up with their own payment method. Um, we've got PayPass. You know, there's we've now got you know Commonwealth Bank apps. We can pay by your mobile phone. You know, there's just a lot of lot of competition um, for business e-commerce businesses on mobile phones and, and payments. Look, look, if they can get it, um, if they can get a, a decent market share with their product. You know, like I said, I don't know the business. I don't know the product, but if they can, you know, these these are often you know very attractive businesses. You know, we've seen pay PayPal in the United States, you know, the early you're mover in this market. Shareholder. Sorry, you're a PayPal yeah. shareholder. There you go. Um, you know, they're, they're highly attractively and, and highly scalable businesses when, when they get to critical mass. Uh, but it's just getting there. It's just very, very hard. Um, you know, for, so for a junior player coming out of Australia trying to crack into a global payments market, which is dominated by financial institutions, um, you know, there, are, there, there is a space for third-party providers. You know, we've seen that with Osforex, for example, you know, mm. shifting currency around. But you know, it is a very tough and competitive market. So, um, and, but I guess this is a smaller company with a little bit of momentum. I mean, last it isn't hard to have record revenue when you're starting off. Yeah. But um, uh, record revenue growth, seventy-one percent. Yes, but up seventy-one percent, thirty-three million dollars. Um, the marketing at revenue was up 118%, overseas revenue Good up numbers. by 11%, customer base growing by about 30%. Yeah. So it certainly sounds like a company on the move and mm. certainly there are risks out there. As Russell said, there's a lot of big players in this space yeah. and technology and is moving tiny, very... Tiny, tiny balance sheet. Yeah. <laughs> this is a buy recommendation or a small cap service. I, I don't know the company well, but they were pretty pleased with the latest results that topped expectations. But it is absolutely a, a small fish at a very big pond with some very large sharks. <laughs> so a small fish in a big pond with some big sharks but some very impressive numbers coming through. MBE is the stock code there and Mobile Embrace and on that note we'll be back with more after this short break. If you'd like to speak with our expert panel please give us a call now on 1300 303435 or you can email us your money at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. We are still taking your calls on 1300 30 34 35 and you can also email in yourmoney at skynews.com.au and we now have Helen on the line from Sydney. Helen, welcome to the show. How can we help you today? Good evening, panel. How are you? Good, um, thank you. Look, I was wondering, have you guys come across Refined at all, RFN? Um, it's being compared to 1PG. I mean, 1PG has gone from 35 cents in July to $5 recently. Sure. And, um, this one I bought in about a month ago at 92 cents. It hit a dollar 94 today, and the Very price nice. is absolutely going parabolic. It's going up 10 percent a day, and um, they seem, you know, nothing um, stopping it. They've got quality management, former REA people on management board, and they keep signing up um, people. They've just pen penetrated the USA as well. So I was wondering if it's come across. Um, Sure. You know, you've come across it and what you think of it. Sure, I mean, one page is another stock that's been doing very well on the market. We're looking at Refined, another one in that HR space. So it looks like this is a, a referral uh, business, another HR type of business. Just having a look at the website and, um, you know, they have an app and you swipe to refer jobs, choose the right candidates, so one of your friends or one of your co-workers, and then, you know, share the potential financial benefits there. Um, sure. Joe, having a look at a business like this, um, you know, what, what do you think? And 
Sure. So I love enterprise software, just to begin with. It's a great model. It's hard to get. It's the Hotel California business model. It's really difficult to get in, but once you're in, you never leave. Uh, customers are very sticky, and if you look at some of the biggest winners, particularly in the U.S., over a very long time horizon, you'd see companies like Paychex, ADP, I own shares of ADP, uh, very consistent cash generators. Once you're in the door, you can cross-sell, you can upsell very effectively, you can raise prices. And I'm also a big fan of a lot of SaaS models, um, which this is, it's software as a service. So you sell, essentially you get in and you just keep getting recurring revenue, it's very nice. I don't know this specific business and I'm looking at financials and there really um, are not many financials to work with. So I guess my comment would just be that I'd be pretty careful about making sure there is a, a pretty clear runway to some revenue flowing through uh, pretty soon because the market cap Google Finance has at 82 million, which is not small for a business that, at least per cap IQ, doesn't really have any material sales as of the end of June. So, you know, I'd want to see some pretty good traction there before I would dive in. And to be honest, if you're really into a SaaS business and, and you're comfortable with higher risk, I'd look at zero instead. I mean, that's a business with about a half million customers and is solidly growing and gaining share. So. Okay, so some ideas there as well. Zero, XRO is the stock code there. And what about Refind, um, Russell? What do you think? Oh, look, I, I agree with everything that Joe said. Unfortunately, I've never heard of this business. Well, actually, I have heard of this business, but given uh, given it uh, did 20 million in revenue in the full year, um, and it's it is signing up clients at a rate of knots in Australia and and and, and the US, you know, it may convert that to revenue at some stage. But I mean, the market is already starting to bake in some pretty pretty big numbers. Um, and it's going to take a long time for this business to reach any sort of maturity and scale that uh, is going to see free cash flow start to be generated. You know, the market is going to look forward and it's going to start price, or it is starting to price this business as a, as a high growth business. So look, I would personally, you know, having been in there at 90 cents, watch this thing go up 10% every day, I'd want to dance pretty close to the door because it's just not a business you can value. You know, it's re you're really trading on pure momentum and, you know, someone coming along and wanting to pay a higher price than what you've paid. So, um, yeah, dance very close to the door um, and uh, I'd be looking for the exits at some stage, but, uh, you know, un unless you see that revenue starting to really flow, um, being so small, look, they'll have to report a, a 4C, a quarterly 4C, which will update. Uh, you on any any sort of revenue gains they're getting, any sort of monetization they're getting of their of their uh, SaaS platform. So look, keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for the AGM, the update, the presentation, and you know, go from there. That's what I would do. Okay, so a very interesting company there, um, and a growing area. We're seeing more and more of these enterprise type uh, solutions coming through, and the HR area. It looks like has been performing very well on the ASX. Let's go to our next caller. We have Chad on the line from Sydney. Chad, welcome to the show. How can we help there you? you out? I'm just I'm just inquiring about the uh, rice shares here. Um, I'm not sure what's going on for them at the moment. Apparently, so he's there. I know they're selling that? a few shares at the moment. Um, well, the shares are supposed to go up, um, whether to hold them or not. And also, OSL shares. Sure. I know they're waiting for a, um, something to go on with that before they get a clearance. Once they get a clearance, apparently, they're supposed to go up as well. Sure. Chad, and what was that first stock you were talking about? DRI. Yeah, right. Air and resources. resources. Sure. Let's start off with Air and Resources, a smaller company on the market. A um, mm. little bit of a strange one, I think, is it started off as a gold company which um, concentrated on Senegal, and then it's taken over a medical company that um, something to do with cosmetic cannabis. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it looks like they've changed direction. So they're, well, I'm, I'm reading here, Aaron Resources, formerly Health, uh, former Health Corporation Limited, is a gold explorer in West Africa. So I'm not yeah, so gold and... Um, Flexibility is something to be valued. <laughs> um, it does look right. like it's bought a healthcare company. It has a, a medical cosmetic cannabis company with operations in Slovenia and... Um, so I'm, a bit, I'm a little bit confused. Can <laughs> yeah, anyone help me out? Uh, you know, this is this is not a business that I would be interested in. Anytime you see a dramatic wholesale shift like that in the business model, it's a big red flag. You know, in, in venture capital land, they might get, make it out like that's a, a great big bold move, and sometimes it does work out, but usually not. Um, small miners are typically where capital goes to die, and they, they devour money, and you can see in this case, apparently they've moved on to something else. So. I would probably do the same if I owned the shares. 
Uh, Russell? Yep, I agree with that. Um, they've got initial range of 15 base com cosmetic products set for launch in the quarter four. Um, they've got a sales website. You know, everyone has a sales website these days to sell their product. Um, and then it's a discussion with distribution partners. Look, I mean, if this is the same management team that ran Erin Resources and they're trying to run a healthcare company, I wouldn't wouldn't say that the uh, the management skill set um, is aligned. Okay, uh, let's move to on this to this business. So, look, I, I, you know, I'm obviously being quite negative, but you know, there's there's a lot of risk in this business. You know, changing Absolutely. strategy from being a miner into a healthcare company and in Slovenia or places if that's where they're going, um, there's a lot of risks. Um, I mean, it'd be a little bit like if you wanted me to perform open heart surgery after the show. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you to do that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other company was Oncoseal. Um, so, looking at targeted radiation, I think, for pancreatic as well as liver well, cancer. You probably know this one better than we do. Yeah, actually, I, I interviewed the Oncoseal um, CEO on the Bell Direct, <laughs> the Bell Direct website. So you can go and have a look at that. And I do have some shares. They are coming up to a CE mark over in Europe, and that should hopefully be announced over the next couple of weeks, which will help the uh, share price hopefully. But mm. if it does doesn't come through, of course, mm. the opposite would happen. But, um, you know, the biotech space is always a difficult area it to is. navigate. And I guess the thing with Oncocell is, an, is that it's not a drug, it's mm. a device, which makes it easier to jump through the hoops of getting it through mm. FDA approval mm. and all the approvals, but still, you know, very early still. stage. And I guess on the negative side, it hasn't had this device implanted in a lot of patients. So that's a key risk. For example, it's often called a mini Certex, but Certex has had its technology in a, a lot of people, so you know the side effects. Where mm. I think the risk with Oncocil is that I think it's 30 or less than 30 or around mm. about that number. That I think it's quite a complicated workup procedure, if I'm not mistaken, as well, versus uh, Certex, where they just inject through the thermal artery straight into the liver. Um, this is quite an extensive workup, and the problem with hospitals is you've got to find time in theatres, and finding time within theatres in a healthcare system that's pretty clogged is, is quite hard to do, and when your procedure gets very, very complex, um, trying to just get patients onto the board, get them treated, you know, it can be quite an arduous task. Um, we own Certex, we've owned Certex for a long, long time. That's a business that has a huge market potential. We estimate they could capture about 120,000 doses per annum. They're currently sitting at about 10,000. And the AGM today, they said first time in, in a month they hit 1,000 dose sales. Yeah, so they're on track to do 12, 12,500 dose sales. You know, they've got good momentum, good, good cash flows, rock solid balance sheet, no gearing. You know, you've got a management team which is driving strategy day in, day out, and they're executing it perfectly globally. You know, it's one of the true export success stories in Australia. But again, it's, you know, it's a medical device company, and they've got through a lot of hurdles. They've got CE Mark, they've got FDA, they've got TGA approval down here in Australia, they, and they're now trying to crack into Asia and Japan, which is one of the biggest markets for their product. Um, Oncosil is a, is, a, is a little mini Certex. Its market is a lot smaller. Its workup is a lot more complex, as I understand it. Um, so, you know, I just don't think the potential is there for it to replicate a, the success of a Certex. But, sure, there's, there's definitely a need. You know, this is a pretty insipid disease to treat cancers and to, to have the impact that these devices have had in liver cancers, that could be replicated in pancreatic cancer. Fantastic, fantastic. You know, I wish them well and I, and I hope they succeed. Okay, so much smaller company, very speculative, as you've probably gathered. Um, what are your thoughts around this space? Oh, well, I'd just probably pass on this one. Just in general, I don't invest in biotech. It's not so much the risk as that I generally do not have an understanding of the underlying science, technology, and another tricky thing is that because each situation is so unique it's very difficult to deport knowledge across companies so it's just not a space that i spend a lot of time looking at yeah so uh, and i guess the thing with oncocil is it's interesting and it's up and coming but um in the liver space you know you've already got a certex there mm. um so it's probably the other cancers that there's potential for especially with pancreatic it's difficult but there's nothing really in that space to treat something like that um so very small companies that we've been dealing with oncocil as well as eri but it is time for a short break so if you'd like to speak with that expert panel now's the time to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email us your money at skynews.com.au 
Welcome back to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight is Joe Mega from Motley Fool and also Russell Muldoon from Montgomery Investment Management and I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. If you have a question you'd like answered, please give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email your money at skynews.com.au and we now have Michael on the line from Sydney. Michael, welcome to the show. How can we help you? Well, thanks for taking my call. Um, I've got uh, two companies. Uh, the first is a growth stock company, Altium, um, ALU, which is an electronic design tool company. Um, sure. I got in quite early, just wondering if the price is out stripping the fundamentals. And also CSR, um, basically a cyclical stock. It's coming down at prices, which are kind of interesting for a bit of a long-term play. Thank you. Sure. So having a look at Altium, um, this is... Uh, a great growth stock. Um, you know, it's really hard to find growth on the market at the moment. So double-digit growth. They do software and hardware for things like um, electronic design, printed um, electric circuit boards, um, and it's a, it's a top five player in that area. So really specialised. Um, I think most of its costs are in US dollars, though, and most of its revenue is in US dollars and euros. So the currency is always a risk there. Um, well, I think. I think we're both long this one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll... Oh, that's all three of us. <laughs> yeah, do you want to... I'll let you go. Yeah. And I'll sure. finish it off if I yeah, need to. Yeah, cool. So to me, the, the short and sweet here is that this is a, a rare opportunity, at least, you know, here on the ASX, where you've got high double-digit top-line organic growth in constant currency terms. you got an overcapitalized balance sheet. Off the top of my head, it's something like 10 to 15% net cash. The market cap is in uh, net cash. It's pretty compelling. Uh, you're looking at a very friendly dividend yield of around uh, three and a half, three point seven percent today, and it's selling for about twenty-two times forward earnings. I mean, that to me is a very compelling mix. I like that a lot, and then I think that you know the the results in the U.S., where they've somewhat recently moved to after another move, uh, have been very very strong. So when you've got great results in the market that you just doubled down on, and uh, you know strong operating leverage, uh, there's a lot to like, and it's our second biggest position. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, look, I think with the uh, the Internet of Everything, you know, it's a technical term out there. They're putting electronic circuit boards in absolutely everything to monitor it. You know, in Coke machines, they're going to tell when they need refilling, just sort of base elevators, when they're stuck, when they need servicing vehicles, anything that needs printed circuit boards. These guys design the software that enables the engineers, the electronic engineers, to be able to build them test them and then go and produce them and, and get them out into into sales. So yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's going to be a product that is going to be in demand for a long, long time. Um, they've got a, a tremendous opportunity to continue to take market share. Um, they're the lowest price competitor in the market um, and that's because, you know, they, and they are taking share. So there's also the ability over time to raise their prices, especially as, you know, they keep on investing in R&D, keep on building their product, keep on making it better. Uh, Joe mentioned that, uh, that it's net cash. I think they've got about $60 million on the balance sheet. If, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're going to make an acquisition. They're going to make an acquisition to improve their software further. So they're just, they're, they're just constantly embedding their competitive advantage and their pricing power. Um, this is a business we own and we'll probably own it for a long time. We think valuation north of $5 is, is certainly on, on the cards for this business. Okay, so all three of us liking Altium, but what about CSR? Um, very mm. different looking share price chart from Altium. Mm. And if we can bring this one up, it's just been absolutely plummeting, mostly because we have seen aluminium prices under pressure. Aluminium is down around about 25% over the past year. So CSR, you'd mainly see it as a building products company that would typically do well at this part of the, the cycle in Australia, but unfortunately the aluminium business is dragging it down. And I think the caller's question was, you know, is it due for a rally? Is it now looking way too oversold? Is it due to come back, Joe? Well, it's certainly statistically cheap. You know, I'm just eyeballing the numbers, 11 times earnings, 7% yield. So you see that and the economy holds up or turns for the better, then I think you'd do well. But generally, I'm not a fan of cyclicals like this. It's pretty easy to wake up one day and the dividend that you thought was safe and the E and the PE is just uh, falling through the floor. And you can learn that the hard way. So this is the kind of business that I'd like to buy coming out of a recession or a tough time. And, and we're just not there right now. 
Okay, so a no from Joe. How about you, Russell? Oh, I get a no from me as well. I just Googled a, a random selection of building companies, uh, Cedarwood Properties, Fletcher Building, for example. I know this is a products company, but you know they're the end, end, end users of these products. They build the houses. These guys supply them with product. I think what you're seeing with the banks, you know, they're, they're, we've, we've seen interest rates rise across owner-occupied and, in, in more importantly, investor home loans. And you're seeing what's happened with clearance rates in Sydney and Melbourne, um, particularly in Sydney. You know, they, they've collapsed as borrowing costs are going up, investor appetite is pulling back. You know, you're going to see that eventually as well flow into new housing construction activity. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing with these share prices. You're seeing the, the market always casts a shadow before it's dawn. You know, it's an old adage in the market, but that's basically the market's way of saying, you know, we look forward to, you know, what's going to happen over the next five years. And the next five years is not going to look like the next 18 months or the not last 24 months where these guys are operating in a very, very buoyant market for particularly investment property and new, new dwelling construction. We think that's going to slow down. There's a lot of reports out there that say it's going to slow down significantly. And if you're exposed to a significant slowdown and a cyclical slowdown, um, that's why you're seeing the share prices react. So when you know when everyone's out there saying the housing housing construction is is uh, has fallen off a cliff, it can't get any worse. You know we get the big wigs coming out and say you know the government needs to do something. That's probably the time to start to look at these things. You know when they're on their yeah. knees, not now. Yeah. Both poets on the panel tonight, dropping shadow before dawn and dropping the <laughs> P before the E. <laughs> we could come up with a song there. Um, but we were talking about two different, very different stocks, Altium, ALU uh, versus CSR. Let's go to our next caller. We've got Gary on the line from Victoria. Gary, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight? Yeah, good evening. I've just got uh, two questions. One, I have about $64,000 in the bank, in Commonwealth Bank, which is earning about probably 2%. Mm. I don't have any debt. And I was just wondering... Well, if you had a view, would I be better off buying the Commonwealth Bank shares to get a better dividend there? And the other question is, I have a specie in black and gold, and I was wondering if you knew much about that one. Sure. So a couple of questions there. We can't give you specific advice, but just talking generally about the attractiveness of Commonwealth Bank shares versus a deposit in the Commonwealth Bank mm. through, uh, through a term deposit. Mm. Um, and we'll start off with Russell. I always think that's a risky strategy to want to go and take equity risk to earn a dividend. Um, it's, a, it's a high risk strategy. You know, people that bought Commonwealth Bank at $96, yeah, they've got to wait a long time for their dividend yield to pay for the acquisition price. Right? They probably wish they were still in the bank. So, you know, I, I would advise against thinking like that. Um, you know, safety of cash is paramount. Until you find an investment opportunity which you're guaranteed, or which you're 100% confident. Oh, of course, you can never be 100% confident in the equity market. But until you get all your ducks lined up and you see an opportunity where you can deploy your capital and potentially earn a higher return, you know, you just don't, you just don't even bother. You just keep it in the bank account and keep on earning a paltry return. Just wait for that obvious opportunity to come by. And we mentioned Altium. Altium is, is yielding very well. I think that's a very safe business. It has a lot of recurring revenue and it's not expensive at the moment, you know. Um, you know so that's maybe an opportunity there to deploy some of your capital. Um, in, in terms of buying a gold miner, um, you know, we don't own any miners. We haven't owned any miners for, for a long, long time. They're very, very tough businesses to understand the geology. You know, they've got to constantly re reinvest to replace their assets. They're digging stuff out of the ground. They dig the gold out of the ground. But, and that only lasts maybe five, ten years, depending on the quality of the resource and the size of the resource. You go ship that off. You're, you're exposed to gold price, which fluctuates up and down. And, you know, I've, I've analysed the gold market, and I'm, I have no idea how the gold market works. I don't know about you, Joe, but I I can't understand it. Um, I'm looking at their presentation. They've got an MPV of $124 million. It's currently trading at $25, $30 million. So that looks, you know, they've got a valuation of $124 million in free cash flow coming out. But what are they going to do with that cash flow? And like I said, they probably need to reinvest it into other areas. You know, it's not going to be cash flow that you'll get as an investor. Um, and that's traditionally what happens with, with these mining businesses. So look, I think these are very high-risk companies. Um, I prefer low capital-intensive businesses such as software as a service, information technology, telecommunication businesses um, with high levels of recurring revenue and, and strong companies in their field and these things. Are, you, know, you just don't need to be there. You know, we aim to make good money over the long term, not a, you know, not a quick buck within the next six months. So. Sure. So um, uh, over to you, Joe. Um, looking at Commonwealth Bank shares versus a deposit in Commonwealth Bank and also Blackham Resources, which is um, just about to start producing at its gold mine in Australia. Yeah, so I, I agree with everything Russell said on the gold miner as well. I'll just, I'll, nothing to add on that one. Uh, with CBA, I agree, and 
You know, I look at the Australian banks today and I see multiple ways to lose, which is the opposite of Altium. So you're looking at significant leverage, which is true of all banks, but in particular Australian banks because of the friendliness around how you account for residential loans have significant leverage. Uh, the economy is cooling off. You look at CapEx numbers, they were down double digits in the last reported quarter. Uh, you're looking at higher capital <laughs> requirements, which is, you know, in English that means you're going to see lower returns on equity. So you're going to see lower profitability. You put all that together and then you'd say, oh wait, well, what's the valuation? Oh, it's selling to three times tangible book value, which is really, really high for banks. It's high by historical levels, certainly by international levels. So <clears throat> you look at rising capital requirements, an aggressive valuation, and you know, the reason the payout ratio, by the way, I know a lot of investors love that the payout's been rising, but it's been going up because they don't have anywhere to redeploy the money. So you put all that together and to me, it's a very unattractive place to be today. Okay, so it looks like both of our panelists sticking with the deposits for safety and staying away from gold by the sounds of it. Well, Gary, I just bought my first gold nugget <laughs> last night. Um, the Sydney Precious Metal Symposium is on at the moment. So a lot of the gold miners are in ta town and Blackham, I think, was one of the ones presenting there. It has that Matilda resource um, and looking at a margin of about 450 Australian an ounce um, so I think with these gold miners a lot of it for me is a currency story if you have a look at the gold miners that haven't been doing well in 2015 there aren't that many of them but Bedell resources Troy Kings Rose um, Medusa these are all gold mines which are overseas so it has that international component and then if you have a look at the best performers on the uh, the market in terms of the gold mines is the St. Barbara Mines, Evolution Mining, Northern Star. These all have Australian mines. So I guess the question here is where to for the gold miners from here, given that you have seen uh, stocks like um, like Northern Star Evolution Mining up more than 130% over the past 52 weeks. And I, I think you have to see another, um, another expectation that you see a fall in the Aussie dollar, which I don't think you're going to see it getting too bearish from here because the market already prices in the future. So um, I think it's time to take some money off the table for some of these gold miners, even though I've made some nice profits here. Well, um, uh, talking around the desk today about you mentioned St. Barbara, it got down to seven and a half cents in the low and uh, it's rallied to a dollar 44. I mean, that's that's a 20 wow. times return of your money. I mean, you can make money in the sector, don't get me wrong, but you know, I think you've got to be lucky. You know, you had to ride it down to seven cents to you know, get it back to dollar 44. But uh, you, know, you can make money here, but it's they're very high risk things and they're not yeah. yeah, anyone can go in it's, as long as they have a lease and they find some gold. You know, everyone's a gold producer, so it's not a sustainable competitive advantage. I think if you're looking at gold, a lot of it has been a currency story because gold has just been in a range this year between 1100 and 1300 despite talk of more quantitative easing. And if that's not enough of the catalyst to get it sort of over that trading range, then you know what is. So then you look at the currency, can you get more bearish than expectations around the Aussie dollar at 65 cents is really what you're asking to be in investing at gold miners at this point in time, sort of in, in my mind. Mm. But, um, yeah. Well, I think you're right. The, the macro question of owning gold as a hedge against hyperinflation, I mean, yeah, you know, three to four years ago, maybe five years ago, that's something I was concerned about. I think we were all reasonably concerned about that with all the liquidity coming in. But the reality is it just hasn't materialized. And mm. If it hasn't by now and you're still hanging on to that thesis, I think you may be hanging on for a pretty long time. Yeah, so is gold just catastrophic insurance? Is, is, is that the only role it plays in, in investment portfolios? I, I personally would own a shotgun instead. <laughs> Okay, there you go. On that note, let's go to an email. We've got an email here from Dave who asks, what's your opinion on platinum asset management as a long-term buy at current prices? I'm looking to diversify my portfolio into overseas markets and see this as both a good growth and income stock. Is this a good option for me? It's so looking at platinum asset management. You know, highly leveraged to the market. Russell, what do you think of this one? Uh, we don't own platinum. Um, I'll plug the, the, the fund managers that we do own. We own Henderson for the European ex exposure and obviously the, uh, the European Central Bank has come out uh, just this week and they're quite dovish. They're going to be very supportive. Uh, we could see that coming. You know, we could see the Europe uh, economy was deteriorating. They needed to step up and, and provide some liquidity uh, to the system. Um, that's obviously going to be good for equity markets and you've seen Europe in particular, um, the London Stock Exchange rally quite significantly. They have, 
a lot of exposure, a lot of their funds under management, all their funds under management for Henderson are located in Europe. So we think that's a, a theme that's going to continue for a long time. In terms of US exposure, um, we also own Magellan. Um, yeah, this is a business that's done tremendously well. It's gone from nothing to a 30, $35 billion funds management business, and they've got aspirations to grow that to $70 billion. Um, and then uh, in terms of Australia and, and Europe, again, we own BT Investment Management. Um, Platinum, we don't own. Um, uh, I just, you know, it's we've looked at the other opportunities and the growth that these guys are getting versus Platinum. Um, Platinum is still a fantastic business. Kerr Nelson's done a wonderful job over there. It's an excellent it's funds are performing well uh, against any international peers you put up against, especially over the last sort of six to 12 months. They've, they've done a fantastic job. Um, but yeah, we're, we're finding a better value in other opportunities given their growth profiles. Okay, and Joe, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Kerr Nielsen's probably the closest thing we've got to Warren Buffett here and, and huge respect to him and the institution he's built. I, I'm not, I don't own any asset managers today. I, I work at one, so I've got plenty of exposure. Uh, but jokes aside, they are very cyclical. They're, they're tied to the market. So when markets are good, typically you got a lot of fixed costs. Your profits zoom a lot higher, faster than your revenue. So that's great. But that can cut both ways. Over the long run, that tends to work for you. And with someone like Platinum, where you've got a consistently strong leadership strategy, strong investing philosophy, and great execution, I, I think that would treat you well. But for, and again, not personal advice, but for someone looking, not personal advice, to get diversification, I think this is this would probably amp up your exposure and leverage to the market rather than ratchet it back. So just general comment. Okay, so, and on that note, we're taking a short break, but we'll be back to answer more of your questions in just a moment. And if you would like to speak with our expert panel, our phone lines are open, so please give us a call. The number's on your screen there, 1300 30 34 35, or you can email your money at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to the show. If you have a question you'd like answered, please pick up the phone and give us a call on 1300 30 34 35. And you can also email us on your money at skynews.com.au. And we now have Brad on the line from Brisbane. Brad, welcome to the show. How can we help you out? Uh, yeah, uh, first time investor, just been looking at transurban stocks and was wondering uh, traditionally, when I look at stocks, the uh, earnings are larger than the dividends that they pay out uh, and the, the dividend payout ratio is 70 percent. Transurban though flicks it the other way and the dividends are always higher than the earnings per share. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, Russell, do you, uh, well, I, we see that with utility companies all the time where yeah. you, you see um, sort of the depreciation on the assets. Yeah, it's massive. Um, t huge, so yeah. the earnings, you know. Yeah, so the way the um, the cash flows to a business work versus its accrual accounting works are two di di different things, and I don't have time right now to go into an accounting lecture, but basically what happens is this is a business that owns toll roads, it owns uh, road infrastructure. Um, it, it, it pretty much only needs to spend from memory something like 60 to $100 million a year to keep, you know, to fill in a pothole, to put in, you know, another light somewhere. You know, its capex is very, very low, but because of the nature of the asset and accounting standards, it's able to really aggressively um, uh, put a depreciation charge through the P&L, which obviously lowers its, its, its reported profit, the tax it has to pay. Um, but underlining that, you know, I went out to Blacktown the other day um, for, for my car, and I, I went through three tolls, and I think I paid $12. Mm -hmm. You know, so as, as towns and cities expand, you know, these, these vital bits of infrastructure become more and more important and more and more costly. You know, tolls, when I first came to Sydney, were 2 or $3, dollars, and now they're nearly $5, dollars, $6 dollars for a car. So, you know, that's just constantly going up and up. So the cash flows are constantly going up and up and up, but the depreciation is also keeping that level of uh, accrual and pat on the balance sheet all the way down. So you know, it's, a, it's a highly cash-generated business. doesn't require a lot of capex. Um, and, you know, they're just, they're just constantly building more roads and acquiring more roads. So that's why the MPAT always looks quite anemic, but underlying cash flow is always quite strong for these utility-type assets. 
Absolutely. So I think, Brad, it's it's just an accounting quirk. So with normal companies, you would get concerned when you do see the, the dividend amount or the distribution amount being more than the net profit. However, with uh, companies like this that have a lot of infrastructure, as Russell um, went through, um, the de big depreciation charge means that the profit's a small amount, even though cash flow is quite strong. And you'll see that with Transurban, you'll see that with utility companies as well. So I hope that helps you out. Let's go to, uh, Adam, good to see someone interested in the fundamentals as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's go to our next call. We've got Michael on the line from Sydney. Michael, welcome to the show. How can we help you out today? Well, good evening, uh, Julia and panel. Um, just inquiring uh, about a stock code CLV, a uh, clever corporation. Just want to know what your view on it and uh, where do you think it's heading? Um, it's had a, recently, it's had a bit of a pullback, I think, from 44 cents. Sure. Down at 34 cents. Sure. So a smaller company, Clover Corporation, CLV, I think they're involved in things like Omega-3, Omega-6, um, sort of vitamins, and um, their big market is Oceana and Asia. Mm. Uh, it says uh, Clover seeks to improve human nutrition and quality of life by developing value-added nutrients for foods, and we, we discussed during the break, you know, milk powder, for example. You know, seen companies like Bell Bellamy's, um, who's who obviously a, a new all-time high today. <laughs> tapping into the uh, insatiable demand from from Chinese for quality Australian um, baby food products. You know, these guys provide some nutri nutritional sh supplements. They go into food, so you would think that you know this this sort of product should be in demand if the end product, such as you know. Of course, they have to have relationships with the Bellamy's or someone who's doing the milk powder. And it doesn't look uh, quite like they do. I mean, it's a company that's been around since 1998. Its revenue is growing, but its profitability is, is really not going too far. Um, in the last financial year, it basically broke even. I'm not sure if there's a few abnormals in that. But, you know, it's a very small company. It's, it's growing quite slow. It's got a bit of cash on the balance sheet. It's net cash. So there's no concern there. Um, Cash flows actually look quite good, so it's doing about two million free cash flow a year, and its market cap is what's its market cap, Julia? Do you know? Yeah, it's market about fifty-eight cap. million. Yeah. So on a free cash flow basis, it's trading. Yeah, you know, it's it's not cheap. Yeah, you know, it's doing two million free cash flow. It's a business that's growing slowly. So fifty-eight million, it's it's probably fully valued, I would say, unless it takes a step change in growth, like a Bellamy's or a Blackmores or a Vitico. You know, these things that are feeding the China demand story for quality health products. So, look, it's in a good space and, you know, just you have to ask management whether or not they can tap that growth potential. Okay. And, Joe, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm not all that familiar with the company, but I'm just looking at the income statement. It looks like EBIT margins have fallen for three consecutive years. So, unless there's something really compelling there in terms of a big investment phase that's going to help the company take a next leg up, uh, that would be a pretty big red flag to me. Um, I am obliged to say that we still own our Bellamy shares. <laughs> it's shameless. I can't help it. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. I saw that at $5, and I've been kicking myself the whole way. Well, well, it is above what is our base case valuation, to be frank. But the shares are selling at a mid-30s multiple forward consensus earnings. The way he looked down then means it's above any valuation that he can come up with. <laughs> I still think that Bellamy's has, um, I think there is a lot of potential blue sky. Mm. I mean, it's an asset light model I like a lot. And when you're talking about a business that has triple digit growth and is selling for, you know, mid 30s forward multiple, uh, it doesn't take too many periods of triple digit growth to make that thesis work out for you. So we've it's worked well thus far, but it is above what we think is a fair price today. Mm. But my problem is that, you know, they're restricted in their growth because they process through vegan That's cheeses. The best problem. <laughs> okay. That's the best problem. Okay, we really need to go to break. Maybe we can talk about this after the break. We'll be back with more of your calls in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct, and joining me on the panel tonight, we have Joe Mager from Motley Fool and also Russell Muldoon from Montgomery Investment Management. And we are here for another half hour answering your questions. So if you have a question, please feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35, or you can send an email to your money at skynews.com.au. And we now have Simon on the line from Sydney. Simon, welcome to the show. How can we help you? Yeah, hi. Just ringing about uh, whether it's a good time to get into some energy stocks, and I'm thinking either Origin or Woodside. 
Sure. So Very having nice. a look at the energy space, we've certainly seen a lot of corporate activity in this mm. space, potentially, you know, signaling a bottoming out of this space. And I guess much better to be picking up Woodside and Origin at these prices. And I don't know if it's signaling, signaling a bottom. I think um, where prices are right now, if you're a subscale player, you're, you're bleeding money hand over fist and mm -hmm. you really need scale. You know, you've got to merge with your next biggest competitor or, or, or be taken up by your competitor. And you, know, you need to get together and, and create scale in assets, in people, in resources and, and try to make yourself profitable because a lot of businesses in this space aren't profitable. So we're seeing a lot of M&A in activity, particularly in that small in this, in this space. Um, I don't know if that's a signal that the market has bottomed, so to speak, but I, I just think it's they need to get together to survive. Um, so we're, we're not there at the moment. We're, we're, and we probably won't ever be there in a large large degree because as we were talking about before with, with gold miners, do you mean these, these guys have the same operating metrics. They find something, they pump it. Um, in the energy space, it's oil, so it comes out of it. It's no pressure, and now there's pumps. You can extract it so you get those wells to last longer. But you constantly got to reinvest your money back into finding new wells and very capital-intensive industry, very hungry. And you're seeing Origin Energy right now come out with a two and a half billion dollar capital raise. I saw the flash come across my desk just before I was leaving for the show tonight. So you know, there's a lot of money that's going to get pumped in. What they, what are they going to do with their capital? Probably need it to repair their balance sheet. Um, they've probably been surviving on debt and hopefully the oil price was going to recover. Hasn't. So look, they're looking for a bit of a lifeline at the moment. Um, I just don't think it's an attractive spot to be when you can own an Altium or you could own an Icenti or a Veda group, for example. Okay, so no to the energy sector coming through from Russell. I mean, if you had to own one, um, and I think Origin is just doing the shortfall from its uh, retail component. Um, so the capital raising pretty much out of the way for Origin. What's that petroleum, you know, potentially on the acquisition trail? If you yeah. had to pick one, which would you pick, Jeff? Uh, I wouldn't pick either one of them. <laughs> I, I, I don't like to invest in companies that can't set their own price. And that is very much the case here. And there was a time where I fooled myself into thinking I could predict where oil prices would go. And, you know, rationally, you look at oil and it goes below the marginal cost to produce it. And you say, OK, well, over the medium term, that's self-correct. You'll see supply come offline. But what we've seen with oil and natural gas and some other commodities uh, recently is that you can have irrational production that goes on for a very long time. And because you have changing production methods today, defining what that marginal cost is is mm. getting trickier and trickier mm. and you, know, you have supply agreements production agreements that make all this you know, much more complex in, in my opinion than you know even just a few years ago it was to forecast where the price of oil might go so it, it's now in my too hard pile and you throw in the leverage that these guys have it it introduces some some pretty significant risk okay well Sorry, sorry, we couldn't help you out more there. Let's go to our next caller. We've got Clive on the line from Brisbane. Clive, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight? Hey, Julia. Um, my question's on uh, Flexi Group. Sure. They uh, announced an acquisition um, this morning um, of s and Finance. Um, I just wanted to know what the panel's thoughts are on um, on the deal and whether whether it was whether it was a good a good transaction or, or whether they paid too much. Thanks. Sure. So we're seeing Flexi Group making an acquisition for Fisher and Paykel Finance for $275 million. Uh, the shares today, I don't think I they think traded. They didn't trade. They're a trading halt while they're doing this acquisition. Uh, so just having a look at this and of course a capital raising also related to this acquisition as well. So. Looking at an acquisition at a time where it's probably pretty tough for the business, certainly tough for shareholders. Um. So I, I don't know this one, uh, but my colleague Donnie Buchanan covers it at The Fool, and he has it as a buy. So just for some of his context, uh, he was pleased to see that the um, company's founder and chairman was tipping in for most of his entitlement, which is a positive. Um, in all, in all in all, he thought the deal was, I'm just reading, thinking it's sensible, expanding the footprint in the core business. Uh, in an attractive price. So it doesn't sound like it blew, blew them away, but that it sounded like a reasonable deal. Okay, um, and how about you, Russell? Oh, look, we own this one in the Montgomery Fund. It's a very, very small holding. Um, I wasn't the analyst that was looking at this to today. My, my offsider right next to me was looking at it. He said they, uh, his thoughts were they paid a pretty keen price, um, headline number. Um, it's a very full valuation for the business, but it does give them a lot more scale. 
um, probably gives them ability to, to, to refinance or renegotiate some of their funding structure, um, gives them some synergies potentially they can take out the business, and I think they do talk about the multiple they paid just on face value and then the multiple they paid on synergies, and obviously the multiple comes down when the synergies are included. Um, I don't know his final thoughts. He was still working on it when I left the office today, but I think uh, our view at $2.20 um, yeah, discount to its then current traded price, I think it was about two fifty. Two fifty five. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's an entitlement offer, um, uh, so we're going to take up our entitlements okay. to the Flexi Group deal. Okay, so that's Flexi Group making the acquisition. Looks like uh, both of our panellists um, thinking that it's a, an okay deal happening there. No, no huge problems there. Uh, discounted capital raising happening at about the $2.50 mark to help fund that deal. We now have an email here from Robert who asks, Regarding the Asciano takeover by Brookfield, does the panel think it would be better to take the cash or the shares? Oh, good question. Russell, what do you think? Shares or cash? Cash. Don't ask me why. Um, when I'm uncertain and I don't know what I don't know, and I, I don't know. Um, I don't know a lot about Brookfield asset management. I'd have to look at it's the company, the assets its own, its balance sheet. I'd have to, do I want to be part of this consortium? Do I not want to be part? And because I don't know what I don't know right now, I'll, I'll take the cash. Okay, so yeah. taking the cash, uh, I mean, Asiano. Um, it's going to be blocked anyway, isn't it? Look, ASIC has come out and they said they've got a number of issues with the deal, um, and the share price has obviously fallen from from basically where it was uh, Brookfield was offering. Um, so I think there's a number of regulatory hurdles that must be superseded before you worry about whether or not you take the shares or the cash. Sure. So it does have a few concerns. Um, oh, I think the view is that I'll probably work through yeah. those concerns because the share price hasn't had a dramatic uh, fall. But um, so I used to cover Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. I oh, haven't excellent. in a couple of years, um, but they are part of a Bruce Flatt, CEO, is another Warren Buffett, the, the Warren Buffett of Canada, uh, as he's sometimes called, a tremendous track record, awesome value creator. And Brookfield is kind of like a, a mothership organization. So there's Brookfield Asset Management, and they have stakes in different groups. Uh, this one invests in anything from, I want to say, Chilean power lines to ports and a variety of assets that very consistent, very transurban-like, if that's something you're into. Um, I, I ended up recommending selling this one on valuation, which I'm not sure how that's worked out uh, since then. But I will say, generally speaking, if I was looking at BIP or BAM, so BAM is Brookfield Asset Management. That's the general partner that manages BIP, which is Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, and all these little offshoots. I would probably take the cash if I was going to invest in Brookfield and invest in BAM, which is Brookfield Asset Management, and the reason being that they are ultimately the ones that have the greatest upside on the underlying investments. Uh, I also think there's some mixed alignment with Brookfield Infrastructure Partners because BAM, the, the manager, gets paid based partially on the size of Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, so it gives them an incentive to go out and issue new shares and grow BIP not necessarily at a price that is good for BIP investors. So sorry for all the BIPs and BAMs. I hope that was useful. Okay, that was very useful. So I'm um, used to cover up and gives us a little bit more insight into Brookfield. So that was Asiana and Brookfield. We do you do want to know how your sole recommendation went or we'll just leave that to uh, Yeah, sure. It was um, maybe 18 months ago. Okay. Uh, 18 months ago would have been... Maybe a year. So year. The start of January, <laughs> maybe a year. <laughs> It's uh, it a bib, not bam. Oh, right. Sorry, I'm looking at right. that one. <laughs> Let's get our next call. We've got <laughs> Barry on the line from Fern Tree Gully. Barry, welcome to the show. What's uh, your question for our panel? Uh, hi, Julia. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, Cardinet, C double D. Sure. They've got a, uh, an rifle. offer out to take up 50% of your shares. Mm hmm. Uh, I just want to know what the panel's view of that is. Because I thought they were probably. They're not that price at the moment, but they've got good potential, I thought. Sure. So having a look at Cardano, and we've seen that takeover bid come through from Crescent for um, half of the holdings. Uh, and I guess Cardano, you know, mostly does its business over in the U.S., so... Hmm. That's a fairly extensive Australian business, though, and it's also grown. Look, this is a business that's grown predominantly via acquisition. It's been a, a, a big roll-up play in the engineering space. Um, it's uh, CEO of the Australian business, obviously departed a couple of years ago now. Then the guy who uh, set up the uh, US 
engineering arm and grew that by acquisition. He then took over, but he was a short stay of CEO as the business has sort of unraveled during this capex decline by our our, uh, our majors. Yeah, and I think the engineering space. Um, in particular is going to be a very, very tough place to be for the next 24, 36, probably next five to 10 years. It's, you know, it's not going to be what we had from 2004 to 2013. We have a very buoyant CapEx, uh, CapEx investment cycle, huge infrastructure spend. Um, that is now completely unwound. And 2016, 2017, there's just a complete lack of big, big projects. And you're seeing these from AGM updates again from some of the big engineers in Australia. Look, it's a, it's a tough space to be if, you know, Crescent Capital want it, they obviously see value and be able to split up these assets and sell them off and think they can be able to release some value and restructure the business. Um, I would participate in the offer. Um, you know, I could see these shares being significantly lower just based on the amount of work that's coming through. Uh, for engineers um, in Australia, I'm not sure about in the US, but I think it's been under similar sort of pressure. Um, and it's not only the workload, the margins for these for these contracts have also, as they become more and more competitively bid, bid for, they've come down from sort of 10% EBITDA margins to, you know, 3, 4, 5%. So look, it's a very, very tough space. So. You know, I think if you've got the ability to, to release a bit of value, I can't see the shares going significantly higher anytime soon. So you know, I'll, I'll probably participate and uh, sell my shares to the consortium. Okay, so accept the takeover offer. What do you think, Joe? I think that was a great response. I mean, I, I agree with all that. I think there's a lot more pain to come in Australia in terms of specifically around CapEx and infrastructure spending. Uh, there has been a pretty huge bloat there for a while, and that's rolling off. And, and in the U.S. right now, there are a lot of dominoes falling from the cutback in energy spending right now, and that's had a pretty big ripple. So there are a lot of tough headwinds there. Okay, so both of our panelists saying accept the offer for Cardano. And on that note, we are taking a short break, but we'll be back to answer more of your questions in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. If you have a question about a stock or shares, now's the time to give us a call on 1300 or you can email us, your money at skynews.com.au. And we have an email here from Mark. And Mark asks, new map has fallen over the past month. Is now the time to get out or should I hold on and hope they recover? So having a look at new maps and it's the, uh, the very clear, good quality maps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the best way to put it. <laughs> uh, They're very good maps. Unfortunately, share price hasn't been doing well at all. Um, new MD, reaffirming guidance. You've also got another company that hit the market, Spookfish, which um, has very clear maps. Clearer maps. Yeah, clearer maps. <laughs> and that, I guess that's the problem, um, technology yeah. in this area. Yeah. I mean, near map is a business that has changed. The thesis has shifted a lot in the past few years. So they were essentially giving away an awesome product for free. And then they were like, there were all these, you know, tradies out there and small businesses that basically built their business around being able to use Nearmap. And someone had the bright idea of, why don't we charge for that? So they did. And that was a pretty good move. But then they decided, well, let's move into the U.S. as well. You know, like a lot of moves into large markets, there is a lot of cost that goes into that. It's it's been tough going. They've signed some interesting partnerships, I believe, but there, things have been bumpy. I think the CEO or the MD uh, departure speaks to that pretty well. They've also, we're big fans of evaluating culture at the Fool, and when you look at Glassdoor ratings for Nearmap, uh, they're pretty poor, so that was leading into the MD's departure. So you kind of put all that together, and I think there's some cultural question marks there, and you know, long term, I do wonder about the viability of this business model. I, I think it's a, you know, a weeding product today, but I'm not sure where this is five to ten years from now. Okay. Um, how about you, Russell, on new maps, NEA? Yeah, I, I don't know it as well as uh, Joe does. Obviously, um, it's a bit too small for us. Um, I think the other issue as well is they've probably bitten off a bit too much. Um, they've had a little good business down here, generating, I think, around that $30 million revenue mark. Yeah. Good cash flows. You know, it's obviously a scalable IT platform, and they've gone, well, market in Australia is probably 40 to 50 million in revenue in terms of size. Um, so at some point we're going to hit maturity and what do we do after that? Well, we need to attack another market. So they've tried to roll out, or well, they're trying to roll out their technology into the United States. Um, and a significant amount of their free cash flow is obviously being reinvested into growing the exact same workforce and team and infrastructure that they have here and deploying those states and taking 
ultra clear photos of US cities. So look, um, obviously the US is a much bigger market than uh, Australia. And if they can crack it, you know, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for them. But, uh, you know, at this stage, they've been, I think, attacking it for 18, 24 months now. They're, they're getting good, good traction in terms of users. And I think next leg, when they get enough, you know, obviously so they spent quite a lot of time giving away for free locally before they uh, went and monetized the product. So, you know, there's going to be a, a long lead time before they have enough users to then go, okay, let's start to monetize this. So I think, you know, it's just a stock that has potential, um, but I think you'll probably need to be patient. Okay, so uh, uh, we do have our next caller on the line, so let's try and get in uh, David from Melbourne. David, welcome to the show. How can we help you out today? Um, I'm interested in your opinion on um, Remulus Resources, just following on the gold theme. Sure, so Remulus Resources are uh, looking at mainly the Mount Magnet uh, mine, but a few other um, mines over in Australia as well. And just having a look at the stock price chart, what a great looking chart. Um, but I guess we, we talked about the gold companies. For me, it's very much currency driven, and, and unless you're going to see a massive um, cost out or an increase in resource. Um, it's not much moving the gold price at the moment. It's the Aussie dollar that's been running. Um, and I guess the good news with the gold miners that are producing is that because of the difficult times we've had in the last few years, a lot of the costs have come out and mm. they are seeing some relatively good margins in Aussie dollar terms. So the big question is, is you know, that's pretty much all priced in. What's the ne next catalyst? You need a gold price to rally and, you know, if you're going to approach a stock market like a casino and think I can uh, forecast where the gold price is going to go, these things obviously look very attractive because, like you said, the costs are out um, and their margins just, you know, they, they, their cost base is ridiculously fixed. And on top of that, you know, if you get a gold price above that, your margin just goes up and up and up and these things become profitable very, very quickly. Um, Look, I, I don't know. I, I, I buy Altium. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the problems with the gold miners is, you know, they, 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 the gold price rises in times of catastrophe, which is when the equity market falls, which is unfortunately when the gold miners also fall. So they, yeah. they increase in profitability, but they're still, you know, sold off with the rest of the market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I look at a, a miner that I've never looked at before, I usually like to cut to the cash flow statement. And that'll usually give you a good feel for what they've been doing with shareholders' capital. And, um, you know, maybe it's been leading to production, and maybe that's the case here. I, I don't know this company. But when I flip through there, I see uh, a lot of equity that's been raised. And when I look back at the balance sheet over 10 years, it looks like they've gone from 59 million shares outstanding to 470 million over 10 years. So, you know, the pie might have gotten bigger, but it's getting cut into much, much smaller slices. So. You know, I don't know the thesis well, but that's usually a pretty big red flag to me when you see that kind of dilution. Okay, so, I mean, gold miners have been doing very well on the market. It's been one area of the market that has been shining, but I think all across the industry, uh, some of the things that they're grappling with is the fact that they are seeing lower grades now and it's becoming harder and harder uh, to find uh, the, these gold mines. And, of course, you sort of need the price to run as well. We now have an email here from Diana who asks, I'm interested in buying Murray Goulburn or A2 Milk, particularly considering the push into China. Which stock do you think will perform better? Oh, looking at the dairy industry, I would go for A2 milk, just putting my two cents in, um, because, it, you know, it's the baby formula part of it that's been really driving a lot of the upgrades mm. in growth for A2 milk. So they have the, the dairy component as well as the, I guess, the value add component, which is um, in their... their they yeah, synthesize um, the protein a bit differently, I think, in the milk. Yeah, the, I do, I do like their baby formula. I use both A2 June. and Bellamy's. Mm. I'm not so sure about their ice cream, though. <laughs> <laughs> they have, like, A2 ice cream out on the shelf. I've been too scared. Well, both of them, are, obviously, the dairy players. Um, I'm looking at Murray Goldburn. It's been, I haven't uh, seen it pop up on any of our screens, but cheddar cheese, butter, milk. Um, yeah, we, we are... Con con considered to be the Asian food bowl and demand for, like, like we said at the start of the show, quality Australian products is going to continue to grow. But the issue you have with ag stocks generally is, yeah, you go to cow, prices go up, well, let's, let's you know, breed another cow, we'll produce more milk, you know, we'll produce more cheese. You know, so prices may go up for, for a short time, but then, you know, supply will come through and push prices down. So it's a very tough capital intensive 
space. But you know, if you're watching you know, four corners or 60 minutes the other day, you know, there, there's obviously some some budding entrepreneurs out there that have taken big swings at big farms around Australia because they think you know the next sort of five to 10 to 15 years for uh, agricultural and, and commodities in, in you know agricultural commodities within Australia have fantastic prospects. So with these guys, obviously, you know, Reinhardt buying a dairy yeah. farm over in WA. And they saw Jerry Harvey use um, Harvey Norman, its balance sheet, to buy a $40 million farm down in, uh, I think, New South Wales. So there's a lot of smart money moving into this space, so they obviously think the prospects are quite bright. So look, I, I don't know who would be the best if it's exposed to Bellamy's and that trade. You know, obviously, that's the early early kicker, early tailwind, and maybe cheese butter and cheddar cheese follows. So maybe maybe start with A2 milk, and then you look for this um, as, as a later exposure if you want that sort of exposure. Okay. Well, what do you think, Jack? Uh, I don't have a strong opinion on either of those, but I can say what I one of the things I specifically like about Bellmays is the asset light model. So they don't produce their own milk. I fully agree with Russell. That's just not a space that you want to be in over the long term. It's very capital intensive, very competitive. You know, cows, they replicate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they grow. Yeah, it's just generally not a space that we'd look at. Okay, so on that note, I mean, it's been a fantastic show, but both of you have said that you've been buying up stocks. So any favourites just before we go, Russell? Any favourites? Uh, you put me on the spot here. Um, look, one we were active in, but I think it's run its course now, is Icentia. Um, unfortunately, I think it has run its course. We haven't been buying probably for the last four weeks. I said we were buyers when the market fell to 5,000. You know, we're buying uh, like Persons, Sentia, for example. Um, at the moment, we've, we've been a little bit quiet and probably, if anything, we're, we're net sellers into this market. Um, but one I still think looks attractive is um, is Altium. Okay. So I've mentioned that a few times. Lots um, of ideas there. You know, they, they've got a huge exposure to the US dollar and with that balance sheet net cash of 60 million, 70 million, there's $20 million coming in cash through you know, every single year, we're going to do a big acquisition. Okay, we're out of time, but quickly, Joe, any? Uh, Burson's our largest position, very defensive business, nice dividend and solid growth, great management team. On that note, that's all we have time for today. Thanks so much to our guests tonight, Joe Mega from The Motley Fool and Russell Muldoon from Montgomery Investment Management and to you, our viewers, for all your calls and emails. Until next time, I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. Thanks for your company. The information featured in this program 